Hello. Oh, goodness. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Miss Satterwhite. Um, so I feel like I don't need an introduction now. But I'm Ellen Satterwhite. I'm a vice president with the Glen Echo Group, and we run the Wi-Fi Forward Coalition. And Wi-Fi Forward, for those of you who don't know, though, I'm so pleased to see so many familiar faces in the crowd. I think um, that's a testament to the work that we've all been doing together for the last several years. But we're a group of companies, consumer groups, think tanks, and other organizations working to make our wireless world better through access to more unlicensed and lightly licensed spectrum. So our unifying principle is to create a wireless ecosystem that is fast, reliable, and as accessible to as many people as possible. Easy. Um, but we do that at Wi-Fi Forward through things like this, through education, through co-sponsoring research, through events. Um, for We're excited about our, our research agenda that's upcoming, but in the past we've done research on unlicensed and its uh, value in the economy, the future value of unlicensed spectrum, Wi-Fi and education, um, unlicensed as an on-ramp to broadband access, and, and many others. So we're looking forward to that, but also more events like this one. So as you've seen in the news, this fall is shaping up to be a busy one. Um, the FCC has spectrum frontiers and mid-band spectrum NOIs and a number of petitions in front of it, um, including, well, I'll let the panelists talk about them, but, uh, and then just last week, some news on CBRS. So not to be outdone, the Hill has Mobile Now and the Airwaves Act, plus a number of rumblings about Spectrum as infrastructure that we're all, uh, all ears for as well. So we thought it was a perfect time to get back together, schools back in session, um, and we wanted to bring together industry and thought leaders to ask three key questions. What's next in technology? Where's the money? And what kind of policy does our wireless world actually need? So, without further ado, I'd like to welcome to this stage our first panel on what's next. Tara Jeffries, Cole Reinwand, Rachel Wolbers, Gabriel Desjardins, and Steve Corral. Coran, sorry Steve. Of all the people to mess up, I'm so glad it was you. Um, for our first panel, our wireless future written with unlicensed. Welcome everyone, I'm Tara Jeffries with Bloomberg Law and thank you for joining us today. Uh, Ellen covered why we're here pretty well in her intro, but uh, specifically this panel is uh, meant to be sort of a scene setter for why you should care about unlicensed spectrum and kind of the the vision from each of these folks and um, for where we're going in in the unlicensed future. Uh, and first, I think we should hear from each of the panelists why they're here, and then we can get into the more of the nitty gritty of the specific innovations they're working on. Uh, we'll start with Cole. Thank you. It's great to be here. <coughs> um, the reason why I'm here, well, Unlicensed Spectrum plays a huge part in Comcast wireless strategy. Um, as a lot of folks probably are aware, we have the largest Wi-Fi network in the US, um, 18 million hotspots. We're also the largest broadband provider in the US. And you know the vast majority of our customers use wireless gateways in their homes. Um, we also have uh, wireless in our businesses. and. We're expanding into other areas of wireless, which we anticipate will combine both licensed and unlicensed in the future. So here to discuss that and learn from uh, my colleagues on the panel and share what I, uh, my opinions. Uh, Rachel? Hi, yeah, uh, I'm Rachel Wolvers. I'm with Engine Advocacy. We are a nonprofit organization that advocates on behalf of startups for uh, great policy that helps promote startup ecosystems. And as I'm sure you all know, unlicensed spectrum is increasingly important for startups. Um, next year, I am told that the crunch base has estimated that over $2 billion will be invested in startups whose core business model enables the internet of things. Um, and so as we move forward, 
uh, with all of this new innovation and technology for startups in particular who are creative and finding new ways to um, improve all of our lives and connect all of our devices, this unlicensed spectrum is gonna be increasingly important. Hi, uh, Gabriel Desjardins from uh, Broadcom. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, Wi-Fi chip suppliers in the world, um, and I run the uh, product management team uh, for, for mobile Wi-Fi. So I wanted to talk mostly about um, some of the very interesting things you know, we're launching um, in unlicensed spectrum, including 802.11ax, um, and you know, the great things we have been doing with spectrum and our, our, our push to do even more. So hello everybody, I'm Steve Coran. Um, I'm an attorney at Lerman Center, but I represent the Wireless Internet Service Providers Association, WISPA. Um, WISPA members, there are about 800 of them, uh, serve four million people around the country with um, broadband, mostly in rural areas. This is their often their only way that they can access the internet. So uh, the innovation here is simply providing through a lot of different unlicensed tools, um, access to the broadband that we here inside the Beltway um, have all the time, and looking forward to a future that it combines a lot of licensed and unlicensed and different kind of license models so that we can continue to um, handle the um, uh, burgeoning uh, demand for broadband spectrum. And finally, I just note today that I was watching TV this morning, and one of the TV stations says it's Digital Addiction Week. So I don't know if that means that we're all supposed to become digital addicts or if we're supposed to find a way to wean ourselves <laughs> off, but um, maybe it's appropriate that we're here on the Monday of Digital Addiction Week. So watch Channel 4 and see how you can wean yourself off. Well, Steve, my interpretation of that would, uh, would be to echo some classic FCC language. Uh, we should strike the right balance. <laughs> Um, and, and now let's, get, let's delve a little more into the details of, of your specific projects uh, for each of you. Cole, uh, obviously Comcast has a huge foothold uh, with Xfinity, but tell us more about your specific advancements in, in Wi-Fi and what you're working on. Sure. Um, I think one of the interesting things that we've done recently um, is, is a new product launch called XFi. Um, a lot of people have, you know, struggled with ma managing their home networks uh, in the past, and you were logging into this strange administrative interface, typing an IP address into a browser, which was very strange, right? And then you'd fumble around trying to manage your home network. And we said, this is not the way it should be. Let's um, simplify this and, uh, you know, surface a GUI that is useful uh, on the web so users, users can manage and maintain their network, you know, create an, S, uh, an SSID they can remember and remember their, their pre-shared key. And, and then we went um, a step further where the real innovation is taking place where we began to allow customers to create profiles. So in my household, I have a profile for myself, my wife, my daughter, um, and even a profile just for our house in general. And then you can assign devices to each of those profiles. So I have my like, tablet and phone and computer, my wife's the same, and my daughter the same. And then, uh, and the house has things assigned to it that are more general, like a Sonos or the thermostat, right? And then you can apply policies to those. The most popular of which you you may be familiar with or seen advertised is the, a feature that allows you to pause the internet during dinner time. So, you know, <laughs> people are like staring at their devices, not talking to each other at dinner. They said, let's stop that. So it's the most popular feature. People press a button, puts all the devices on pause, and people can enjoy their dinner. But you can also apply policies to specific devices, like my daughter, I don't want her using um, the internet after bedtime, um, you know, and things like that. So it's been a, a huge success, and we're continuing to evolve that platform, but I think that's one of the innovations where, you know, beyond just the technology, the spectrum, and, and you know, the wireless technology aspects, building the service and the usability around is one of the things that we're working on. Uh, that's great, and and Cole, if I could follow up real quick, uh, I'd love to hear about uh, things, kind of the future, the the future vision of large scale use of Wi-Fi, uh, not just in in one individual home or or uh, for the individual, but in collective sort of spaces like stadiums and uh, large event venues and things like that. What are you guys doing in that space? Um, that's a it's interesting. We're we've just built two large um, arena complexes very recently. We built the new SunTrust Park at, uh, for the Atlanta Braves, um, as well as Little Caesars Arena for the Detroit Red Wings. Um, and what I think you're seeing in these spaces is, 
in addition to being like extremely high density and you know the number of APs increasing to, to numbers that weren't really thinkable five years ago when we were building our first arenas. I think at, uh, you know, at, at SunTrust Park, we'd have well over 1,200 access points. In Little Caesars Arena, just a, a basketball arena, there's over 700, right? So you're getting a um, large number of APs in there, but you're also dealing with um, some new unique things, like there's, they're multi-tenant properties now. It's not just a single-use venue. You've got, um, you have got residential in there. You've got retail space, you know, an entertainment space, a small mall. And so when you start combining these different networks and you want to have different um, sort of usage policies and usage rules in those different areas, it becomes very difficult to segregate the areas. Like I want free access in this area, but I want this to be more restricted, right? And, and I think those are things that um, the industry will struggle with a bit to figure out how to apply those policies on top of one another in these mixed use venues. But in terms of like, you know, the performance, the high, high density venues, I think we continue to evolve. The, the networks perform great. I, I guess the last thing I'd say on that is, I think we're seeing the beginning of the end for 2.4 gigahertz in these environments. Um, we're not really enabling it anymore. It's serving no useful function. It's just too saturated and too congested. And so, you know, the, the, the cry for more uh, spectrum will continue. Um, and particularly in these high use venues where when you're doing channel bonding and so forth, you just, you're just running out of capacity. Mm -hmm. And Rachel, I'd love to talk more about what the impact of unlicensed is in the startup space. Can you uh, go into that a little more? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I think you know we all kind of understand how unlicensed spectrum really uh, promotes innovation and promotes uh, uh, provides uh, startups a an easy, low cost to entry access point for Wi-Fi and unlicensed spectrum, but. You know, I think one of the things that Engine is really good at is providing anecdotes and, and some actual startups who are doing really cool things. So I wanted to go through a couple um, that I think are really interesting in this space and show the breadth um, and the future of, of what Unlicensed Spectrum can do. Um, so I want to start with a couple who are in the health space, which is a really interesting one for there's Flatiron Health, which is a cloud-enabled software platform that helps manage um, oncologists and clinical trials and getting uh, oncologists from across the country to be able to upload a lot of data and analyze that. Um, another one that I'm actually going to get to talk to later this afternoon is Asuka Wellness, which has a wearable that helps with pain relief. Um, and they're seeing really great uh, usage for opioid addicts and people who are um, weaning themselves off opioid addiction and how this bracelet can really help enable uh, health advances and help reduce pain. Um, then, you know, there are some other exciting examples in agriculture. We were kind of talking about the rural aspects um, of unlicensed because I think, you know, I'm from Michigan, I'm from the middle of the country and, and a proud daughter of farmers. So I really get excited about ag startups. Um, but there's a great one called Farm Logs, which I talk about all the time because uh, they have a really great IoT software platform that helps farmers uh, better utilize uh, the data that they're collecting and make strategic decisions on when to harvest and where to apply pesticides and all sorts of really cool uh, ag uh, spaces that really do rely a lot on unlicensed software or unlicensed spectrum. Um, and my last, my last anecdote is uh, a luggage called Raiden that basically you can buy this uh, piece of luggage that uses unlicensed spectrum that uh, will tell you how much your bag weighs, how where your bag is at all times. It'll tell you what the weather is going to be like where you're going. Um, and it also includes a USB port so that you can charge your devices while you're traveling. Um, and so I think that's another really cool, interesting startup that is using unlicensed spectrum in a way that we might not uh, you know, readily think about here in DC. Great. These are these are all really innovative uh, ideas. And uh, as someone from from rural North Carolina, I've got to say, uh, I think the ag and tech intersection is is something that's somewhat undercovered and, and important to talk about. Um, and as a follow up to that, I I'm curious. I've heard before in in sort of policy conversations with people in the spectrum space that Silicon Valley tends to favor 
more unlicensed, whereas you know the East Coast uh, tends to favor more licensed uses, and and perhaps the FCC even you know tends toward that. Is that consistent with with what you've seen in in startups all all across the nation and uh, perhaps on the West Coast? Yeah, so I think um, you know I hadn't actually heard of this divide, um, but I was thinking about it with some of my colleagues uh, and and talking through where we think the this divide might happen. And I think that you know in Silicon Valley we hear a lot that their mantra is to move fast and break things, and unlicensed spectrum is at least in an area where you can move fast uh, because you have a low barrier to entry. You're able to, and you don't have to comply with a ton of rules. You can get on it immediately and start innovating. Um, whereas maybe some of our East Coast uh, startups are you know, a little bit more traditional in the way that they're approaching spectrum usage. Uh, but one thing that I think is really important is that uh, I, I really feel like the tech debate shouldn't necessarily be east versus west coast, that there's a whole entire country who's using uh, spectrum in a lot of different ways, and unlicensed spectrum is going to be particularly important for all of us from flyover states and all of the startups that we have um, who, you know, because they're from flyover states, they might not necessarily have access to the newest and latest and greatest technologies that you sometimes have on the east and west coast. So they're thinking about the resources that they do have and how to approach uh, the problems that they're facing with the what they have readily available to innovate. And so I definitely, one thing that I've really done since I started with Engine um, has been to focus our, shift our focus away from necessarily Silicon Valley to the fact that all 50 states have a tremendous amount of innovation happening. Um, and for policymakers in DC to understand that it's not just Silicon Valley, that it really is every single congressional district um, that has a great number of resources and startups and innovation happening. Great, and uh, Gabe, I know Broadcom has a lot of innovation going on. Uh, tell us more about how this new Wi-Fi standard is um, advancing the future of unlicensed uh, airwave space. Sure, thank you. Uh, first, let me say, Broadcom, we try to never break things as quickly <laughs> as we move. Never, ever break anything. <laughs> Be a good neighbor. Backwards compatibility, all those things you want. So um, 11AX, I was around for the launch of 11AC. That was my first, first mobile product. It wasn't quite clear why people would want to buy 11AC. Faster throughput, maybe better range in the home, whole home coverage, but these were not obvious benefits to, to the user and to the consumer. I think 11AX, which you know, you will see product, products have already been announced. Tons of demos are gonna show up at CES, products on the shelves uh, in the access space by April, I'd say, um, and then client devices by, by end of 2018. So this is happening now. 11AX does solve real problems for users. Uh, you know, how many places have you been where, you know, there are a lot of users on a single AP, you simply can't get on the network? You know, AX has a massive improvement in, in network efficiency, um, in spectrum reuse, uh, has a lot of tools for helping do network management. Um, there is higher throughput on top of everything else, um, but it's really a capacity improvement. You know, as we've seen these massive deployments uh, you know, of Wi-Fi, you know, to a, to a scale of densification we couldn't have imagined. Uh, you know, like we heard earlier, you're running out of spectrum, you're running out of space. You simply don't have capacity in traditional Wi-Fi networks to manage all that traffic. Uh, 11AX aims to change that. 11AX has significant increases uh, in capacity. So, you know, um, not just in, in venues, but, but even in the home, uh, you will see significant improvement uh, in, in Wi-Fi performance. Uh, and this, this is, you know, again, this is something that I find really exciting because there's no question why this is needed. It's not a throughput play. It's not a, oh, you know, we'll be able to cover your garage where before you had a dead spot. This is literally in the places where most of us use Wi-Fi uh, and, you know, and, and cellular and, you know, can't necessarily get uh, the data access that we need. That's what we're going to end up improving. Mm -hmm. And Steve, uh, we've 
I, I was just at the FCC meeting recently and the 3.5 gigahertz uh, proposed changes were a big deal. Um, as, as we all know, this band is the setting for a lot of discussions about the future of spectrum and how to divvy it up between uh, licensed, um, non-federal, federal users. Um, it, it's certainly, it, it has been known as the innovation band. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly, of course, says that um, it, his proposed, the proposed changes led by him would lead to more investment, more innovation. There's a lot of talk about this band. Uh, could you get into um, the conversations about this area of spectrum and the, the CBRS rules? Sure. I have been told that this is not the spectrum policy panel. <laughs> so I'm throwing you bones, Steve. Come on. <laughs> I will talk. It's going to be very hard here. Um, you know, I want to go back to something Gabe says that ties into this, and that is that you know the Wi-Fi community is rightfully concerned about capacity, and in rural communities, what we care about is coverage. And um, if you're using the same band, they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. And this is why the CBRS rules, as they were originally designed, kind of supported a lot of different business models, whether it's whether it's IoT, whether it's rural broadband, whether it's small cells, whether it's venues, whether it's neutral hosts. Um, everybody in this room could probably come up with 10 more than, than that. So, um, uh, and, and there is opportunity when you have small license areas to kind of do some more experiment because you're not spending as much money on the spectrum. If you're not spending money on spectrum, you can spend money on deployment, you can spend money on, it lowers barriers to entry and it makes it a much more compelling business model in, in rural America where there's a reason why those are probably gonna be the last places where you see 5G. And the reason is, is because the return on investment just takes much longer. We've seen it with 3G, we've seen it with 4G, and that is the mobile carriers because that's what they wanna do and that's their business model, choose to build out in the densified urban markets and suburban arc markets first. But that doesn't mean that rural America should be kind of left behind. And the CBRS band is uniquely situated for a lot of reasons that we can go into um, as being kind of a great band to um, expand broadband to people in this country, 23 million rural Americans that do not have access to broadband. This is a great band and we have a lot of members that are um, teed up and have invested and have de deployed in reliance on those rules as they exist and are, and are really ready to go. Steve, I'd love to hear a little more about, uh, beyond this specific band, uh, about the needs of rural uh, rural Americans who uh, may not be served uh, in the broadband arena as well as they should be right now. I don't think their needs are any greater than they are for anybody else. It's education, it's civic participation, it's agricultural needs, it's Internet of Things to manage farms, it's... Um, uh, not having to drive to the library at night to access the, the, the Wi-Fi at the library in order to do your homework. Um, it's, it's really all those things. Years ago, I want to go back like six years ago, I read this book. It was written by a couple of sociologists, and it talked about the rural brain, the rural brain drain. And a lot of it was how the lack of infrastructure in rural markets was keeping you know, the millennials away. They were going to Minneapolis, they were going to Chicago, they were going to Denver, and they weren't going back to their farms for a lot of reasons. But one of them was the lack of, um, of infrastructure and connectivity. And our members are out there trying, trying to do that. And Spectrum is a very vital tool to do it because other um, technologies can't de be deployed as quickly or as in a cost-effective manner. Mm -hmm. And shifting gears for a second, Gabe, um, when you were mentioning this, this new Wi-Fi standard, uh, it brought to mind th the needs of, of urban settings, uh, like multi-tenant environments, uh, multi-tenant buildings, big, you know, high-rise apartment complexes, that sort of thing, where you have multiple users in multiple uh, households, that sort of thing. Um, could you get into uh, what Broadcom is doing there on this new standard? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so Broadcom has done a lot of analysis of these different kinds of scenarios that you've mentioned. Um, and so there are a whole number of features um, in 802.11ax. Uh, I mean, I think a key one is uh, is OFDMA, um, you know, which essentially allows you to combine uh, the data from multiple users into a, a single packet, single time slot. So whereas before, um, you know, or not before, but in today's Wi-Fi, each user gets a turn, 
um, in 802.11ax, they'll all go at the same time. So you know, today you can certainly have, in the environments you've described, uh, a lot of users taking up a very, very small amount of airtime. And now they'll all get combined uh, at the same time. Um, and that'll free up a lot more time um, for new users, or they'll free up time for other users to get, to get more bandwidth. Great. Um, and I'd love to hear from, from each of you uh, about any, we, we've talked about capacity, coverage needs, um, all of these challenges. Uh, I'd love to hear about any specific sort of challenges or hurdles that you've each uh, faced when advancing your, your Wi-Fi projects. Um, we can start with you, Cole. Where do I begin? <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know. I've been I've been doing Wi-Fi since probably 2003. Um, back started at Earthlink, um, and we were doing municipal Wi-Fi networks at the time, partnering with cities and attempting to service customers with a primary line service through Wi-Fi. So, I think that same challenge, the same challenges we faced back then, are the ones we face today, which are, you know, the propagation characteristics and the power at which you can broadcast Wi-Fi signal is just not strong enough to penetrate walls. Um, so back in the day, it was we were having a lot of difficulty servicing customers by deploying outdoor hotspots and trying to reach them inside. Today at Comcast, we have the opposite problem. We have uh, 18 million hotspots, the vast majority of which are indoors, and a weak signal bleeds out and floods the entire city with weak, unusable Wi-Fi signal. And those of you that have used Xperia Wi-Fi, you know, have, if you can get it into a good place and you can get a good signal, it's great. Delights the customers to have a free Wi-Fi where they are. But a lot of times what's happening is um, Wi-Fi is, is very sticky um, in iOS and Android, as you know. So um, the phone will latch onto the Wi-Fi. And if it's not usable, it doesn't let go. And eventually, you have to manually intervene and, and flip it back over to 4G. Um, that's probably the biggest single challenge we face today is how to get that balance right how to work with the uh, OS and OEMs to change the way that connection management works in devices so that users don't have to manually intervene, um, that the phone can intelligently make choices about when they've got a good Wi-Fi signal and when they've got a, uh, you know, would be better off on, on a 4G signal. Um, I, th I think that's our biggest challenge. I think one other thing, um, I wanted to mention, uh, j just since you were asking about urban environments, so we did this very interesting thing um, earlier this year, we launched a service called Xfinity Wi-Fi On Demand. Um, basically, it looks a lot like, you know, with, when you used to go to the airport and you'd buy, you know, an hour pass or a, a day pass and maybe a hotel. But basically, what we did is we um, launched this and, and basically said, if you create a, an Xfinity account, you don't have to pay us. It's a freemium account. But if you, um, if you sign up, then we'll give you two free sessions, and then you can sort of pay as you go. Um, a very interesting you know, uh, scenario manifests itself, which is we suddenly had several million customers every month signing up and several million more coming back every month. And in fact, we've you know, got in the first five months or so, we had 10 million people sign up for this service. And when we study these people, um, they're different than you would think. They're not business travelers, right? People traveling through airports looking for their, you know, their hour pass. They're, um, they're low-income people. They're 90% of people in are in MDUs. Um, they're people in transition who don't know whether, you know, they're moving out of town, they're moving to a different city. Um, there are people that have access at work and at school but don't have access on the weekend. And so what we found is we created this new internet product, a new paradigm um, for users that allowed them to buy access on their own terms with no long-term commitments. And it's really been um, very interesting in a, as a solution to the, the digital divide um, in creating this um, internet product that allows people to buy you know, only what they need when they want it. And so I thought that, that was kind of an interesting when you were asking about the urban environment, the th thought came to mind, like how many millions of people are buying these passes today and you know, using that as their primary internet service. And th that's really interesting. I, I'm curious how you see that uh, compared to, say, prepaid phone plans. Do you, the demographic that you describe sounds 
somewhat similar to those who might buy a, a prepaid plan with a, a carrier. Do you see it mm -hmm. as a, a competitor to that kind of uh, offering or a supplement or? Um, it's complementary, I believe. In fact, Comcast itself has three products at least already that service that same customer segment. Um, we've got a product called Internet Essentials, mm -hmm. which is a highly subsidized um, cable internet product that uh, you know is sold for nine ninety five a month to folks that qualify, and basically those are you know families with kids on a school lunch program or certain folks in the senior segment, community uh, community college segments. Uh, we also have a prepaid internet product. Um, the difference with that is the customer has to buy their own modem, um, which is not terribly expensive, but there's that upfront hurdle. You have to buy a piece of CPE and put it in your house, and then you can pay as you go, buying like a week or a month at a time. Ours gives, um, ours doesn't require uh, CPE in the premises, which is nice, right? Because mm -hmm. the device connects directly to the network. The other thing is, is we allow you to buy on much smaller increments, like the hour pass, the two hour pass, and the day pass are like among our best sellers, although week passes have been increasing in popularity. But I think those are the differences. And then, you know, again, I think wireless, prepaid wireless phone products, they're all those similar in how they're constructed, servicing a different need. It's a, it's a voice product. Mm -hmm. uh, shifting, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, shifting back real quick to the uh, challenges uh, question. Um, I'm curious, Rachel, what uh, challenges your members have experienced or, or that engine has experienced in uh, in advocating yeah so um I was thinking when we were talking about challenges I am from Michigan I went home I don't know Labor Day and uh, I went to my old bedroom and there are all these books on coding for dummies and automation <laughs> for automotives and I went upstairs and I'm like dad what what's going on downstairs and Rachel, my car emailed me. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to email it back. And I was like, uh, okay, Dad, I don't think you're going to have the relationship that you'd like with your car. Um, but, you know, it, it got me thinking about how much, you know, machine to human communication, machine to machine communication, um, and our own communication um, is moving almost completely online and how there's so much more potential there. And so one thing that I think we see a lot at Engine is just trying to convey to policymakers and to and other leaders and communities about um, why this is so important and how this is really the future. And maybe, you know, maybe you've only gotten one email from your car, but that's definitely the way that things are going to move in the future. And so really we're trying to make sure that uh, businesses and startups that are investing in IoT devices and in wireless communication are making sure their stories and their products are are told to to others who might not necessarily be adapting these technologies right away but um, that they're surely their their children will and um, maybe you know they'll figure out how to how to email their car back sometime soon <laughs> Truthfully, I'm not sure I know how to do that. <laughs> I definitely don't. <laughs> um, Gabe, going to you, um, what challenges do you see uh, Broadcom has confronted or uh, is confronting? Uh, well, first of all, I think it seems pretty clear that we need to get some of our pre-production products into the hands of Comcast so they can see how much better they perform. <laughs> um, <laughs> and would love to solve that outdoor walking past people's houses and picking up their Xfinity issue. Uh, I think we have, if we have something we can do on that. I mean, you know, the range of issues that we run into with Spectrum, I mean, again, the list is, is, is incredibly long. Uh, you know, there are a number of very interesting products that we can help enable um, that either need, you know, a lot of Spectrum, um, you know, say 160 megahertz channels, um, or, you know, very low latency applications that need a clear channel. And with the amount of Spectrum we have today, it's not obvious that you can always do that. Um, you know, so we've gone down a path of trying to get easier DFS rules, um, which thus far I think has been somewhat unsuccessful, but I hope that that, that turns out better. Um, you know, and then we've basically just been looking for opportunities to get more spectrum, um, you know, better access process to spectrum, uh, allocation of it and better access to it once it's there. Um, so, you know, the 5.9 gigahertz band, the 6 gigahertz band, these are the things that are all 
very interesting and very important, not just to us, but also to, to our customers and, and to their customers. Mm -hmm. And and just a quick follow up: How do you see the the scarcity problem in unlicensed, as it relates to the you know auctioning of, of licensed spectrum and uh, the the whole picture of of shared as well? Well, can I say uh, we have to strike a balance? <laughs> I, I guess so. I guess I, I'll allow that. I, I mean, look, you know, <laughs> right now Wi-Fi is already uh, a five G network. You know, we've already rolled out in all kinds of places, you know, massively dense networks with massive numbers of users that work really, really well. Um, and, you know, 11AX adds on top of that. Uh, Wi-Fi Vantage adds on top of that. So there are a number of features that make, um, you know, Wi-Fi use its spectrum uh, even better. You're not going to solve all the problems that are already solved with Wi-Fi uh, by creating new licensed standards. Um, and so, you know, there needs to be enough spectrum um, out there available to a technology that already solves problems um, and solves them at a lower cost of deployment. So, you know, again, I mean, not, not to roll back to this strike a balance, but you, you know, you, you already have, you have solved problems, you have a technology that solves them. Uh, going forward, you need to make available enough, enough spectrum so that Wi-Fi can continue solving these problems. Mm -hmm. And just real quick, Cole, did you want to respond to that uh, <laughs> Gabe's comment about uh, your product versus for, versus their product? Well, no, it's uh, we <laughs> use yeah, they use plenty our of product. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean it's just the the evolution of the next standard. We're looking forward to it as well. I mean, as soon as we can get AX into the network, we will. Yeah, absolutely. We'd like to get it in your hands as quickly as possible. So we, we <laughs> should we should talk about that and figure out figure out where we are because I. Uh, Lawyers in the room. <laughs> Steve, I uh, want to want to touch on uh, what challenges you guys have, you and your members have faced along the way sure. as well. Sure. By the way, my navigation system swears at me sometimes. <laughs> no, seriously, we had a Wispa has a, an annual show in Las Vegas called Wispa Palooza, and um, one night we do a CEO roundtable, and I co-facilitate that and go around the room and ask everybody the same question. Which, what are your biggest challenges? And these are guys who are in rural areas that may have 200 customers or 1,000 customers or 5,000 customers or whatever it happens to be. And every year we do this, we inevitably get the same answer. It, it, it really comes down to scale. And scale is really two things. Where do I find good help in my rural market? And the second one is spectrum. Where can I get more spectrum so I can serve more people with better stuff, with, with faster speeds, with lower cost, and it really comes down to, down to that. And while our past has been built on, on unlicensed, I think the future will be built on more of a mix. Um, I'll give you a great example. In the 3.65 band, the 3.7 is a band the FCC opened in 2008. Um, it has been widely used by wireless ISPs, by municipalities, by critical information infrastructure, by a lot of folks. Um, there's 80,000 locations that are registered in the FCC's database. 20,000 of those have been since in the last two years when the FCC decided to open up the CBRS band. And that's been, that's really for one reason, it's called LTE. LTE is being deployed right now in 365 with the, in reliance on the belief that we'll be able to use the lower 100 megahertz with a software upgrade. That means no truck rolls, no hardware, just flip a switch when the equipment and the spectrum access system are ready to go. And that's a real game changer for, for our members. And it's something that's really not going to just change it for them, but change it for a lot of folks who want the benefits of LTE, the coverage and the distance you get with, um, with it, with the comp competition we're seeing among manufacturers. Um, we still will see proprietary Wi-Fi based gear in that band as well, which can accomplish the same thing uh, just with a software upgrade. So we're looking forward to a lot of competition and accessing a band that is right next to kind of where most of the deployment has been with 900 megahertz long saturated, 2.4 gigahertz saturated, 5 gigahertz is now the workhorse, but that's filling up pretty fast too. So uh, this is really kind of the, to come back to the first question about CBRS, this is sort of the uh, um, the promised land, if you will, for, um, for rural America and access to, to broadband. and retaining access to that spectrum and additional mid-band spectrum on, you know, licensed, on a, li on a protected basis, let me say a protected basis, 
um, without having to pay high auction costs is really where the benefit is. Great, and and your your mention of the word game changer uh, reminded me of something that I, I think is important to note for for all of you. I, I want to hear what's what's kind of a game changer along the way in the in the last few years or in the last few, even in the last few months that has come up and changed the way you think about unlicensed. Uh, we can start with you, Cole. Um, well, again, I've been you know most of my career has been focused on Wi-Fi, but I think something that's come up this past year that sort of caught my eye and made me start rethinking um, unlicensed was Comcast's launch of a product called Machine Q. Uh, Machine Q is a, is a LoRa WAN uh, product using 900 megahertz. Um, we launched three cities uh, this year, um, Philadelphia, Chicago, and San Francisco. And the amazing thing was how quickly they were able to turn up Philadelphia with complete coverage of the metro area using three towers. Three towers, complete coverage, reading, capability to read meters, sensors, you know, on the street, and with the capability to even do deeper level penetration into basements with, you know, potentially only 30 or 40 strand mounted units around the city, you know, and this is, my group has, you know, deployed millions of hotspots trying to get the coverage we've got, and they're covering entire cities with 30 to 40 with deep penetration into buildings. And that sort of set the wheels in motion about how powerful this is, um, powering low-powered, you know, devices um, that, you know, running off of batteries. Again, only eking out a few kilobytes here and there, not a lot of bandwidth, but still enough to communicate with those devices. I think that's game-changing. I think we're about to see, you know, sort of the, the birth of this IoT industry in the U.S., and I think Comcast will be one of the leaders. Rachel, you already kind of answered it with uh, your your father's car email, <laughs> um, but a anything you've seen in your in your work with startups specifically that uh, that has been a game changer or just an innovation that you didn't expect to come across? Yeah, I was worried you're gonna have us talk about Mark Halperin for a minute. <laughs> Game changer. <laughs> oh, anyway. oh, goodness. Unfortunate um, choice of words. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think one thing that I've been really, uh, you know, I just started with Engine six months ago. So a lot of the spectrum issues are relatively new to, my, to me, um, not necessarily to Engine. Um, but one area where we've been getting, because, you know, we, have a, a huge database of startups and we email them to sign on to letters or different things. Um, and in the spectrum space, one thing that um, I've seen a lot of is uh, a lot of the medical health devices um, mm -hmm. and just the great amount of data that is being collected and how much you're going to need um, more spectrum particular and more access to wireless and, and spectrum in rural areas in order to um, collect all of that data and to help people have a better understanding of some of the, the problems that are really impacting society in terms of our, our health and wellness. Um, so that's an area that I'm going to continue to be really fascinated by. Uh, there are just so many interesting startups doing um, new things in, in the wearable market, and I think that's probably because it's it's a market that's easier to enter. You know, you're, it's a lower cost of entry, um, and then there's just so much of a need. If you're looking at how startups are solving problems, um, the health space is one that uh, I think is, is really ripe for a lot of innovation. Certainly, I, I've been hearing a lot about uh, potential use cases for um, you know, wearables and telehealth apps and things like that. It's a really interesting space. and. I know it's certainly not a startup, but T-Mobile, uh, I saw, put out some kind of wearable onesie thing. And I'm not sure it would look good on me, but it, it's it an pink? interesting concept. I, I believe so, yes. <laughs> Every, everything is, is pink. <laughs> well, that's, that's great. Um, Gabe, what about you? Any, any, I'm trying to think of a synonym for game changers that doesn't evoke the <laughs> storyline you mentioned. Uh, any, any. Any game changers for you? Well, <laughs> not to make this too topical to this uh, to this panel, but uh, about a let's say a year ago, uh, my employer decided they were going to stop paying for my wireless bill, 
Um, and so all of a sudden, instead of being someone who was 100% on cellular all the time without paying any attention, I'm now monitoring exactly how many bytes I use. Mm -hmm. um, and so I am now constantly looking to be on Wi-Fi. And one of the things I noticed is that, you know, if I sit down somewhere, almost all the time, I'm actually on Xfinity. Um, and so it just sort of, you know, a light went off one day where I was like, hey, you know, people have always been talking about building this nationwide or worldwide, you know, unlicensed Wi-Fi network. And it's already happened. I understand, you know, there's some growing pains, some, th some things that need to get fixed. But, you know, you essentially now have this seamless network, uh, you know, that's an extension of my, of my home network. Um, and so, you know, now I'm able to manage my data. It's not like every single month I'm running out. I got to push up my limit with Verizon. And it's like, okay, now, you know, my data is all, all running over Comcast. I'm curious how you how you think um, that will go. How do you think that might change going forward or um, impact consumers, given the proliferation of, of unlimited data plans um, with the wireless carriers? Well, I think one of the mistakes that people made was assuming that there is a way to increase the revenue per subscriber in cellular. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a fairly sticky thing, and so you know. LTE came and revenues did not go up. Um, you know, so other providers are making the same amount of money per subscriber as they were, you know, with, with, with 2G. Uh, and I just don't, I don't see that, you know, I mean, sure, you can give people unlimited um, cellular data, but you're gonna have to charge them the same price as, as a limited plan. You know, there just, there just isn't money in the pocket um, to, you know, to give it to cellular. So I think that there's there's this huge need, and it's it's starting to be met, um, of having access to to Wi-Fi. Uh, I mean, even you know even the cellular carriers themselves obviously you know have to partner with uh, all kinds of Wi-Fi providers in order to make sure people have coverage everywhere. So you know I, I see it really as um, you know this just a manifestation of that issue. People are not going to pay any more to have a cell phone than they're already paying, and so you need to have some other technology. And and now it's now it's here. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve, any you've you've talked about specific uh, sort of bands of spectrum that you that you think are kind of ripe for for innovative uh, discussions and things like that. Um, anything else you'd like to add to sort of the the game changing um, talks that you've been seeing about various spectrum bands or anything like that? I'll, I will give you thirty seconds of policy wonk if you want. <laughs> I would just say generally that when we talk about spectrum, we have to be talking about sharing spectrum, sharing it with incumbents, sharing it with the federal government, and sharing it with each other and finding new and innovative ways to do that. Um, I go back to about 15 years ago when Chairman Powell talked about the four dimensions of spectrum. Well, I, I, I thought there were, you know, I, know, I knew about the fifth dimension. I just didn't know there were four <laughs> dimensions of spectrum, um, power, geography, frequency, and time. And you know we haven't really gotten to sort of time sharing a whole lot, but but we we do talk a lot about geographic sharing and now frequency sharing, um, and those are those are things that I think um, are going to continue to be um, a big part of our our discussion as we talk about spectrum going forward. Going forward, that is an excellent segue to my next question. I uh, want to hear about all of your sort of your vision long term for for these. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi developments, Wi-Fi advancements, um, and I mean, right now we've got, you know, wearable devices that can track pretty much everything about our health, it seems. We've got cars sending us emails, we've got smart cities in the works, uh, all of these exciting things. Where do you see it going in the future? I'll start with you, Cole. Um, I think all those things that you mentioned are things that we're looking at and exploring. Um, I have you know, a lot of interest from the automotive industry today in terms of um, not, not necessarily like consumer coverage you know, in the car, even though the, the car of the future is basically a living room on wheels. And Comcast already, we're in a lot of living rooms, so we kind of know how to service those. Um, but you know, the interest I'm hearing is more about um, sort of administrative and back office needs, like you know, diagnostics, uploading telemetry data, things like that, more like, you know, offload when the car gets to the garage rather than, you know, uh, streaming a movie while you're going around town. 
Um, smart cities, I, I mentioned our work in uh, LoRa, you know, we're a member of the, uh, of the LoRaWAN um, Alliance and, you know, obviously a ton of interest there in smart city applications, meter reading, sensors, you know, all kinds of things there. Um, our network, our Wi-Fi network in general, we're already starting to put it to use in, you know, sort of addressing, um, you know, the the unlimited data plan issue, right? We've we've come up with Xfinity Mobile, a mobile phone offering um, that allows you to mix together um, licensed and unlicensed licensed spectrum into an offering, and the vast majority of our users are actually selecting by the gig plans, not unlimited plans. They figure they can manage their consumption better than you know the, the the carrier can and people are saving a significant amount of money right people can actually manage their network manage their data use put as much onto wi-fi as possible and actually lower their bills and and we're seeing um, significant uptake on that product so i think you'll continue to see that um, the cbrs is very interesting to us i think again it's an to me it's an lte play and and you have to be in control of the handset to take advantage of it or you ha or you have to have a neutral host um, strategy and so I think Comcast is still evaluating how or if it wants to participate in um, in that sort of marketplace but I think there's huge potential um, obviously a ton of spectrum available for low low cost we assume um, so I think you'll see us in a lot of areas um, you know across Wi-Fi as an MVNO a potential MNO um, CBRS spectrum LoRa um, even, you know, even plays like Multifire, we're exploring everything. Um, and so, you know, you'll see, see us continue to invest. Obviously, wireless is, we believe wireless is, is the future of broadband. Thanks. Uh, and Rachel, what about you? Uh, where do you kind of see uh, future developments coming? Yeah, so um, I think if I had to start, you know, we kind of talked about Silicon Valley wanting to move fast and break things. Um, and I get to, as a startup evangelist um, think a lot about disruption and markets that are kind of ready for disruption. And I think that um, any time where, you know, I think right now there's a lot of ways where we could improve the efficiency of our use of unlicensed spectrum and making sure that uh, you're getting better sharing of time and frequency and geography and all of that. And so, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for startups to look at um, the way that this market is functioning and how we're going to move forward, whether it's, you know, we work a lot with Starry and, and broadband alternative uh, technologies. Um, and so I think uh, my, my startups that I work with get to think about very large, grandiose uh, solutions that maybe don't always work in the real world, but um, I'm hopeful that we're going to come up with some very innovative ideas uh, as we're able to get um, full coverage and, and all of Americans online. Great. And Gabe, we've already got this, this new Wi-Fi standard that you've discussed. Uh, what do you see as the next step? Well, I tend to look at it like this. Um, the tier one phone makers want the products I have right now. The operators want the products from two years ago. Uh, the automotive makers want the products from five years ago. And people in I IoT are still buying the junk from 10 years ago. It's sitting, it's sitting in the warehouse unsold. Um, so I think there's a, a huge, there are going to be huge strides made, particularly on that IoT side, as they start to actually adopt more, more modern technology. I mean, I have you know, 802.11 BG chips that I still sell into IoT. Um, you know, so, you know, that's, that's technology you can't do all that much with. Um, eventually, you know, that market will move forward and we'll start making use of the more modern technologies and you'll see some, some very different things there, you know, massive industrial automation again, you know, um, you know, huge, uh, smart cities, networks, um, thing, things of that nature. That's, that's where I see the growth of connected devices over the next five to 10 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, last but not least, uh, Steve, where do you see the the future going? Well, I'll, I'll speak to it from an industry perspective, and I think the wireless, uh, the fixed wireless industry, is really poised to to take off. Um, there is a, a, a lot of interest in our band. We're starting to see uh, more articles, more analysis, um, more investment come into our market. And I think um, I, I read a projection once that said that in the next five years. Um, will double the customer base. And that's a lot of that has to do with 
um, equipment prices coming down at the same time they're getting better. Um, competition among manufacturers, among technologies, whether it's Wi-Fi based, whether it's proprietary, whether it's LTE. So um, I think all those things make it easier to deploy in places where people do not have access to broadband. So our future is to bring at least 1G or 2G or 3G or some other fixed G technology to rural America. I think it's great that we're riding on the coattails in some respects to a lot of the 5G innovation that's going on. And I'm the first to say that, that um, fixed wireless is benefiting from LTE, which was developed as a mobile standard. So um, all these things kind of point to a really um, uh, industry-wide, a, a, a really cool future. Excellent. Well, on that note, uh, thank you all for an exciting discussion. And I think we're going to open it up to an audience Q&A. So come at us with your questions. Thank you. Is that on? Yeah, okay, great, thanks. An, an interesting uh, kind of a kickoff of the presentation and the discussions that is gonna follow this session in particular. Great ideas, Cole is coming from Xfinity and, uh, and everybody else. One area that I think we probably need to pay a little bit of an attention to at least have a conversation on is the area of uh, security and, and privacy. There's a lot of data that's being generated by the way, my name is Reza Jafari. I'm from Wireless Broadband Alliance, a co-chairman of the Smart Cities or the Connected Cities. So I see again in that area, again, the IoTs and infrastructure sharing and spectrum sharing, all those things that we do together is going to create a lot of data. First, we need to know whose data is it anyway, who's, who is going to own the customer, who's going to own the data, and what we're going to do in terms of security uh, to make sure that the more users that come uh, and have access so this wonderful technologies and innovations are being secured in light of that's what is happening every day in our marketplace. Thanks. Excellent note. I, I agree. That's an important topic. Unfortunately, I think it would take an entire day to <laughs> really adequate, adequately uh, break it down. But thank you for, for noting that. And I absolutely agree. We should be having those discussions as we talk about these exciting innovations. Hi, Peter Flynn from Viasat. Um, fascinating discussion, and and uh, I I, uh, I connect with an awful lot of what you're saying. What I haven't heard here is, um, as wireless demand goes up and as customer demands go up in a broader spectrum, um, on the 5G side, I hear a fair amount of the message of being infrastructure discussion. Is that it doesn't do you any good to quadruple or tenfold the wireless speeds if you don't have the infrastructure to support that um, as those new uh, demands go up. I don't hear that so much on the Wi-Fi side. Is, is it because by some miracle you already have more than enough infrastructure and backhaul and so it's not an issue? Or, or is, is the conversation just not mature enough to discuss infrastructure demands that Wi-Fi is gonna pose on these new networks? Um, I, th I think probably the reason why you haven't heard that is because are, are twofold. Um, number one, just the the pace of you know of the generational um, releases of Wi-Fi is pretty quick. Um, I mean, we're basically on AX will be the sixth generation of Wi-Fi, right? So at that pace, I think there's an assumption that as long as like that innovation continues and continues to deliver the kind of um, capacity and, and throughput increases that that uh, does, then you know that's one one thing that we can um, look forward to. The other is just the sheer amount of spectrum. I think because the five gigahertz spectrum is still relatively lightly used compared to the two four, that gives us a lot of um, you know hope that there's capacity there for at least you know several years. Um, and then <clears throat> you see things like you know discussions have already begun about um, adding adjacent. Uh, spectrum like the 5.9 gigahertz is a potential target, right? Um, not not really utilized today. Could easily be um, attached to Wi-Fi use, um, and then you know talking about like uh, you know mid-band and other other spectrum. I think that's the reason why you don't hear as much um, a panic in the Wi-Fi space as you'd probably do in the LTE space. My theory. Yeah, I mean just to add to that, I mean I think that. 
LTE hit the point or cellular hit the point where they needed to do efficient sharing, frequency reuse, and really active management, and obviously, you know, RF design of the networks a long time ago. Wi-Fi is not yet at that point, right? There are a lot more gains to be eked out in terms of in terms of efficiency and spectrum reuse um, with you know the existing infrastructure. And so, you know, there are a lot of things you can get for a very very small investment relative to the amount of money you're going to have to throw at cellular to make it work. I'll just add this, and it's it's an anecdote. Um, I have a client who's a broadband provider in Puerto Rico, and um, while they still lack power in a lot of places. He came to me and said, Steve, can you get me some, can you find me some spectrum that I need down here? And I said, well, why can't you use what you have? And he says, well, it's still a little dirty. And by the way, I need it for backhaul because the fiber is down all over the island. And I was like thinking, hmm. So we were able to actually get him, since you mentioned the 5.9 band, um, a special temporary authority to use 75 megahertz island-wide to use, so he can do like a, a wireless replacement of Fiber. So you talk about infrastructure, fiber being one form of infrastructure that was, you know, kind of, I don't know if it was aerial or if it was ground or whatever, but it's not working. So we have a wireless replacement and he's, um, you know, got his network and helping other people out with, with their networks as well because you need less infrastructure when you have higher power, uh, in this case, higher power bandwidth. Any other questions? Talk about how the, the last farm next to my office finally closed. So uh, we're, we're, not, we're not partners anymore. Anyone else? Last call? OK. Well, thank you all for, for attending. And uh, definitely stick around for the, the next few segments.